Game sense is the most important part of being a great Overwatch player, and for that reason I've come up with the top 10 ways to bring your game sense abilities to the next level. My name is Nate, and welcome to Blizzard Guides. Overwatch is a unique FPS, no doubt about that. Whether it be the defining hero classes and choices when it comes to team comps or the rich ultimate economy, you're just not going to be relying on angles and aim alone in this game, which means that your game sense better be top notch to survive in the world of ranked. That's why I've taken a good moment to think about what it really means to have good game sense and how to get that nailed down in the fastest way possible with these 10 tips. And also really quickly, a special shout out to Vex, Magnusio, Slime Games, and Axan for Nitro boosting our Discord, but with that said, let's get into those tips. So let's talk about game sense. What the hell is game sense anyway? You hear this term thrown around a lot, and to be honest with you, I didn't really know what it meant even when I hit GM for the first time. To put it simply, game sense just means repeatedly coming up with an educated guess using the process of elimination from the environment and clues around you. It's kind of like being a detective of Overwatch. You need to sniff out the clues, whether it be from the sounds you hear, enemy body language, the ults you and your team use, bullets whizzing on your screen, and much, much more. A good player can take all of this information into their head in seconds and come up with an accurate prediction of what's to come. And in all honesty, you may already know what it is, but applying it and acquiring it is another story. So with that said, let's take a look at what the pros do and think about in their plays in that moment, just so you can get an idea of the basic thought process. Look where their Ryan got to, and now where he's backing off to. He never, you never let him uh, get into a position of actual danger. So if you do see this situation, try and bait the opponents into overextending and then push hard. Because if they are pushed around this corner, it means they're also in the sight line of your back line, but not in the sight line of their back line. I'm gonna stick it at Anna. I got her. I want to like get behind the shield of the, so I can like stick it. I just I was just waiting for it to jump, so be predictable in that momentum. I can stick it like that. Like behind the shield. Chances are, if you're having trouble improving on your game sense, you're just straight up not thinking about the impact of your plays and the factors involved in the success and outcome of that play in the moment. A pro's game sense is well refined. They've critically thought about each situation that they've ever been in, and then they can call back on that if they're able to or quickly come up with another plan for that situation based on factors and past experiences. When you really take a good look at it, game sense is something that all players call upon, but only the masters know how to manipulate. Given any situation these masters of game sense come up with the best plan in the heat of the moment. So let's talk about the rest of these tips to bring you on your way to becoming the master of the moment. Space. Space is one of those elusive terms that pros and coaches love to throw around that doesn't really make sense to 99% of the player base. Rather than calling it space, I like to talk about it like pressure. You don't want to be in an area of high pressure, and you do want to be in an area of low pressure. If you're under a lot of pressure, you'll definitely start to get nervous, and fib ults, die, miss your shots, or a whole host of other things. Pros understand this and have manipulated the game of pressure to the point where they can generate pressure on a whim. Let me show you how they do this. Slide here by Link, sir. Kick thing. Oh! Eventually does hit the shot again. SPB just has the bad habit of running into bullets. Thrown in there by Link, sir. Jake still applying the pressure from on high as well. And this is going to be the Houston Outlaws really trying to crank it up as Link, sir, once again gets to show us what he's capable of with a mechanical hero. Ah. Finland's gift to esports strikes again! Now, obviously, one part of this play is Lynxer's great aim, but the real reason that this play actually worked was because Houston was able to create space effectively. NYXL basically loses if they have to go on point because they have no range, and Farrah Mercy in Widowmaker is nothing but range. Wrecking Ball forces NYXL forward for the risk of being booped from behind, and Farrah boops NYXL's Anna off regardless, which forces Brig to give up high ground, creating space for Widow, which allows the Widow to go for pop shots and eventually ends up with the entirety of point to be opened up as space for Houston. That's just space in a nutshell. Anybody can create space and anybody can use space. Houston was able to pick apart that play in mere seconds, coming up with the plan because they've played the game a ton and understand where comps are the weakest. First, they recognize that Somber Goats isn't really going to have all that much range. I mean, look at the heroes that they're playing. They're, there's nothing that has that much aim range where bullets will fly very far. So they force the enemy to play in the part of the map that disables their most useful asset 
of just being able to steamroll anybody on the same height and floor as them, and then they strategically move forward to corner NYXL using their kits and abilities to deny any advantage that NYXL could have had with somber goats. But with that said, knowing what space to open up for your team is the most important part of the teammate related part of your game sense. If you knew that your widow is gonna land shots and she wants to be on high ground, then you probably want to help her with the threats that aren't going to allow her to get on high ground. Likewise, if you're widow and you notice that your teammate has disabled that threat, you can suddenly use that high ground and miss all the shots that you want, since you'll be free to do so without any threats on your side. Next up, let's talk about mistakes. Immediately evens it up with two of his own. The rest from Ginger Pop, gonna reset this for denial. It's been their bread and butter as <laughs> oh. <laughs> Most players make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but the bigger mistake is not doing something about the mistake an enemy makes. If you notice that the enemy Reinhardt is maybe a little bit up too far, you need to be yelling at your team to focus that Reinhardt and do what you can to keep him overextended, whether that's by booping him, stunning him, power boosting allies to help kill him, or whatever you need to do. Go watch a streamer play Overwatch and I can guarantee you that you'll hear things like, hey, this person's overextending, or punish that guy, or we gotta pick, let's go, or just the incessant screen screaming of a particular hero's name. That usually means that somebody has made a mistake and it needs to go punished. I'll be honest with you, the majority of the climb from bronze to GM is just learning about how to stop making mistakes and how to punish mistakes and really has little to do with your aim and much other stuff like that. If you can punish every single mistake that the enemy makes, then you're probably going to instantly hit a really high SR, but obviously that's not realistic. And to build off of that, the best way to learn to punish those mistakes is to analyze your own mistakes. If you die, just please think about what caused you to die. And then when you see an enemy that is committing that same play, then hey, maybe you can copy that person that caused you to die and cause the enemy to die. One super important part of capitalizing on mistakes and creating space is called first pick advantage and spawn advantage. First off, first pick advantage just means that moment when a team gets the first pick. Generally, if you get a first pick without teammates dying shortly after, you should be in a very advantageous spot. If you or your team gets the first pick, that's the moment where you should be getting aggressive and using your non-ultimate abilities to try and win the fight, and then commit ultimates should that aggression not provide more picks or point capture or something like that. First pick advantage in Overwatch is a huge deal. Most fights are won over first pick advantage alone, so that's something that you have to have in the bag. However, the only exception to this rule is spawn advantage. On 2CP and payload maps, one team will always have a closer spawn in relation to the objective, and spawn advantage becomes an even bigger deal than first pick advantage. If you know that your spawn is closer, sometimes it's a bit better to play a bit more aggressive, because you can always swap to a stall hero that allows you to contest the point aggressively, or maybe if you got a pick or two, you're able to get back before those two picks do. Likewise, if you're not the team with the closer spawn, you sometimes need to realize that two or three picks might not even be enough to win a fight. Henceforth, why huge ultimate combos are so important on second point of a 2CP map, since you have to be getting a ton of picks to negate that spawn advantage that defenders have. Next up, adaptive thinking. This stuff is what really, really makes you a better player. Here's what I mean. Uh, park it out. I'm here with you now. I'm here with you now. Widow's still doing it. Is it? They're in server. Yeah. Dude, I'm not getting your old. I'm out of here. Boost the protection now. I'm rezzing. Hey, XCC, if you get low on blue box, you don't have to jump. You can just kind of fall down. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I did, and he was waiting at the bottom, and he had jumped from across uh, the map. That was crazy. Okay, so ults, Notice how immediately after XQC makes that poor play, he thinks about what caused that play to happen, he thinks about how it happened, and I can guarantee you he won't be making that mistake ever again. If you ever get out game sensed by an opponent, which in this case it was better map knowledge, you better commit that new game sense to memory. That way, in the future, let's say that you played Widow, you'd know about that angle and you'd be able to recall on it and become better at Widowmaker and become better at other heroes that can abuse that angle, and likewise, you won't get caught out there if if you know your enemy is a smart player. Adaptive thinking is being able to discern your enemy's capabilities and adapt to those new pieces of information. Keller, the Widowmaker in this play, was using that angle a lot during the game, but once XQC got caught by that angle, his teammates no longer played that angle and Keller noticed this and picked a new angle, so in this case, both XQC's team and Keller used adaptive thinking to their ability and modified their plays based on the information presented to them, and they were able to adjust their playmaking. Now, I want to talk about something that's incredibly important that's looked over a lot. 
every single Overwatch Pro, and I mean each and every one of them, has insanely good hearing. Hearing is your most useful tool in the game, and Blizzard made no mistake in the sound design for Overwatch. Each ability, each character, each ult, each footstep has a unique sound, on top of the varying effects for things that are around a corner, across a wall, above you, and more. You have to first off, learn the sounds of footsteps of each hero, and then you need to be able to read what abilities have been used by the sounds alone, or perhaps if an enemy is flanking, or more things like that. For example, if you want to use Blade as Genji and you hear Anna use Sleep Dart and Nade, then you're probably safe to go in for that blade at least against the Anna. People make plays like this all the time in higher ranks, where they hear abilities and hear ults and react to that without even needing to see the enemies in the first place. So when you're playing, try your best to pick apart the sounds and hear what's been used by your enemy and your team so that you have a multi-dimensional perspective on the current status of the fight rather than just relying on your team to relay information to you, which as you know pretty much sucks because your teammates don't know what's going on half the time. Also, two quick tips about that. One, the enemy sounds are always louder than ally sounds, so you can generally distinguish which is which by sheer volume and distance. And two, turn on Dolby Atmos in the settings. It may sound weird at first and even give you a headache at first, but this completely changed the way that I play the game and use hearing to my advantage. Now, let's talk about understanding the enemy's objective. In every game, in every comp, in every situation, teams are going to be fighting over some area of the map or getting some ult combo off to win the fight and ultimately the game. Examples would include fighting to gain control of a choke point or getting nanoblade. Both of these are two things that are stuff that would win a fight. If the enemy is suddenly at choke, it's much easier for you to win, and if you get nanoblade, it's much easier to win. Your enemy will have a few objectives that they're just collectively working on that could win them the game, so in this example it was the choke or nanoblade. This is what you need to stop. There's always going to be a few steps that your enemy needs to take to pull off these plays, and if you can stop just one of those steps, it'll be a lot easier to win. For the nanoblade example, using a grab to stop Genji from dashing around is a viable option that's easy to execute and stop the blade. If you don't stop that Genji, well, you lose. You have to have plans to counter the enemy plan, so get into your enemy's head, think about what they're trying to do, and then don't let them do that thing that they're trying to do. That's all that a win condition is. It's that one thing that you have to do in order to gain something that will let you win the fight, or it's that thing that you have to do to prevent your enemy from gaining control. If you can identify the steps that it'll take to get to a certain area or get a certain combo off, figure out what your enemy will do to stop you and stop them from stopping you from doing that thing, and then also do that to the enemy, and you'll be an insanely powerful player. Now, this is a short one, but an important one, understanding enemy body language. This you just have to get a feel for, which is why it's going to be a shorter point, and you can just improve on it by watching the enemy intently, and then figuring out what plays they make based on what movement patterns they have before they make that play. It's gotten to the point where I can generally read when a Zarya is about to grab, a Genji's going to blade, a Ryan's going to shatter, and more things like that. You just get a feel for what actions most players do right before using an ult, while also knowing what ults are available. A simple example would be a Genji dashing up for a nanoblade. Pretty much every Genji in rank will dash up right before they nanoblade, which is a good example of body language. If you can learn to read this body language by paying attention and trying to adapt your knowledge over time, you'll be able to read a surprising amount of situations by enemy movement alone. I'm blocked. Yeah, we'll shoot her. Yeah, sure. Ultimate economy is honestly a topic that deserves its own video, but to summarize it in a nutshell, there are four things that you need to understand about ultimates in Overwatch. First off, please, 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 please stop holding on to your ultimates. Ultimates are the one-stop shop to instantly winning a game, so please don't hold on to your ultimates for very long, even if you waste your ult. It's better that you waste it and learn from that mistake than to hold on to your ult forever and use it on the next game. I see this particularly with Shatter, High Noon, Nano, Graviton Surge, Rally, Transcendence, Mace Blizzard, Orisa Supercharger, Torbjorn's Molten Core, and Widow Sights. 
Your ultimates don't always have to be big to get value. So if I named any of those ultimates and you're holding on to it for more than, let's say, two minutes, just use your ultimate and try and get as much value in that one situation. Sometimes you can bait the enemy to use too many ults, or sometimes you can even just get a single pick, which is worthwhile, or maybe a single ally healed, or anything like that. Second, you need to know what counters your ultimate before you do actually use your ult. You don't want to invest your Graviton Surge and Hanzo Dragons into a fight where the enemy has a transcendence you need to have a plan to get rid of that trans so that you can win the fight with that grab dragon combo. Third, you need to know the situations where your ultimates are absolutely necessary, especially in the case of Lucio and Zenyatta, whose primary purpose is to counter other ultimates. This means studying the pros and watching how they play and watching your own VODs, which is actually now possible thanks to the replay system or the Overwatch League viewer, which you can watch any past games in any angle. And finally, fourth, you need to know how not to invest too many ultimates. For example, winning a fight with six ults is actually worse, in my opinion, than losing a fight after using one or two ultimates and saving the other four. Never, ever, ever overinvest your ultimates. You want to make sure that if your team is using a combo and it doesn't give you enough advantage to warrant using more ults to win an objective, don't invest more ults. You'll gain a taste for this the more that you actually use these decisions and make these plays, so don't be afraid to hold back your ult in the event that you think your team overinvested in their ultimate abilities. And last but not least, a very simple thing that I do want to mention, you need to know your role and fulfill your role all the time. Don't ever go do something outside of your role's purpose unless you know that your team doesn't need to rely on you, like on this clip. I'll tell you when we're gonna, we can, okay, we can okay, go okay. forward, you can go for nade, I think, in a second. Yeah, no, pero. Let's go for nade. I'm kidding Monks actually. Okay. Monks is one, Monks is one. No sleep. Nice. Arisa, can you help you, Arisa? Winnable, we're still winning. Kill at least a point. ML7 only gets this playoff because he knows that he can kill the Mercy and that his team won't need him because he has a good Orisa. Most flashy plays like this don't work in ranked, especially at lower elos because your teammates kind of suck. So please stick to your role and know what you can rely on your team to do without having to worry about it constantly. My rule of thumb is that if you're going to go something like that plan, you always need to have an escape ability to get out of the situation and a plan to return to your duties immediately which in this case ML7 actually did have. So even if the play went wrong, he was able to get back into the action of healing immediately or able to escape from the fight, but ultimately he didn't need to because he executed the play perfectly. But anyway, that's all I have for you today. There's a lot more that I could have covered here, seriously, a ton more, but I wanted to keep the video a bit shorter so that way it didn't bore you, and I also just wanted to give everybody the essential tips to get started with Game Sense and the road of understanding how the game works and the mentality that they have to adopt to become a better player. If you guys enjoyed this video, drop a like, and if you want to get a shout out like the others did in the beginning of this video, be sure to join our Discord and hit us up with that Nitro Boost. We also have an Instagram and a Twitter that you can get follow to. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Have a nice day. My name is Nate, and this was Blizzard Guides.